Welcome back to our afternoon session. We have two more keynote talks this afternoon um, before our poster session at the end of the day. So we'll get started. Our first uh, keynote of the afternoon is going to be given by Nadia Carlston. Nadia is the VP of Product at Sandbox AQ. Um, she was previously before that at uh, AWS Center for Quantum Computing and also at the Department for Homeland Security. And so hopefully we've got her slides and she can come up and we'll hear all about it. All right, thank you. So great to be here. Uh, great to be uh, in Chicago again. It's actually the first time for me since COVID. So it's uh, nice to see the area and I got a really nice day, so I got lucky. Um, so, as the introduction mentioned, uh, I was previously at Amazon, so most of you probably know me as the person that loves quantum computing. Um, I worked on Amazon Bracket and at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing on fault-tolerant quantum uh, computers, uh, which you've heard a lot about this morning. Uh, but since joining Sandbox about six months ago, I've been working on things that are very different from quantum computing, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. I want to talk about quantum technologies that are not quantum computing. Um, so let me first introduce Sandbox EQ. Um, how many of you have heard of Sandbox? Oh, wow. Okay. Most of you. Um, so we became an independent company in March of uh, this year. So we're still a relatively young uh, company, uh, although a lot of the people uh, on the team have been working on quantum for quite a while. Um, some of them were working on this at Google, at Alphabet, where Sandbox EQ started in 2016. Uh, and of course, since then, we've added quite a few uh, people from the different quantum fields, as well as engineers, scientists, uh, AI professionals, and, and so on. Uh, to form this new company, Sandbox EQ, um, that has been operating since, since March. So one of the um, things that I asked uh, about a lot is what is our connection to Google? Um, the answer to that is we don't have one anymore. We're actually a completely uh, independent company, uh, both from a structural standpoint uh, as well as a financial standpoint. And that was a deliberate decision um, because we wanted to be very much hardware agnostic. So we can now work with any cloud provider. We can work with any uh, quantum computing uh, provider if, if we so choose. Um, in terms of customers, uh, we work quite a bit with different enterprise clients, um, but we also serve uh, government customers as well. Um, so that's, that's also one of the nice things about uh, being an independent company is that we can really work uh, with a lot of folks and we can be pretty nimble about working with different customers, even very large ones. So what do we do? Um, our goal at Sandbox CQ is to deliver practical solutions that leverage both quantum technologies as well as artificial intelligence. Uh, so from the very beginning uh, at Sandbox, the vision had always been to bring together those two disciplines uh, and to really try to find the intersection that could bring uh, solutions today, as opposed to waiting for quantum computers or waiting for very long timelines of different quantum developments. Um, so why AI and quantum, uh, you might ask? Um, one of the reasons is we really believe that it's the convergence of those two technologies that are in the end going to be useful for customers. Um, there's a lot of um, connections uh, between the two technologies for some of the applications that we are looking at. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of customers look at it as two different tools in the tool chest. And they want to understand AI, they want to understand quantum, uh, but really what they're trying to do is solve a problem and uh, they don't necessarily care uh, what are the different tools that you're bringing in as long as you're solving the problem. So that's why we're looking at both uh, and trying to leverage both. So we're developing products in different application areas. Uh, one of them is uh, quantum sensing. Uh, so it's actually funny, there was a question earlier today about why is there not more in quantum sensing? Why do you hear so much about computing and not sensing? Uh, we are doing quantum sensing. Um, and one of the reasons is that uh, you can actually have practical applications with quantum sensors today. Uh, one of them is quantum navigation. We're also looking at quantum sensors uh, in the medical settings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Another one of our application areas is uh, simulation and optimization. Uh, and there, what we're trying to do is reduce the time and cost to develop uh, new molecules, and that as well can have multiple applications for different industries. 
And then last but not least, um, we're working on quantum security and quantum communications. So with quantum computers um, being developed, we have to rethink how we do security. Um, so we are looking at the impact of quantum computers, uh, but we're also thinking of ways to leverage quantum effects to have increased security. So things like uh, QKD and quantum communications become very relevant there when we talk to customers that are security focused. So I'll talk about quantum sensing uh, first and how we can make use of quantum effects to sense uh, the world around us and enhance the sensitivity of, of different types of measurements. So quantum sensors exploit uh, quantum properties or quantum structure to sense the world uh, around us and give us more precise measurements. One of the things that I think is really cool about quantum sensors is that one of the things that makes life difficult when you're building a quantum computer uh, is the fact that qubits really interact with the environment. And that makes it very problematic to keep uh, coherence and you want to try to reduce that noise as much as possible. With quantum sensors, you're kind of taking the opposite approach and leveraging uh, that interaction with the environment because that gives you a measurement about um, the, that external environment. And these types of sensors can be used for all sorts of measurements. You can use them to measure time, you can use them to measure forces, uh, different types of fields. Um, but one of the things that is very useful is to think about how you can take that interaction and turn it in, into a measurement. So you can do that in multiple ways. Um, and there are different types of quantum sensors, even with, within the categories that I mentioned, there's different hardware types. So just like in quantum computing, you have different modalities of quantum computers. You have superconducting qubits. You have ion-trapped computers. Um, there's a similar thing happening in quantum sensing where you can have different hardware types, and they all have pros and cons. They all have trade-offs. And depending on the application that you're looking at, you might not necessarily use the same one. There's no single best quantum sensor that's going to just be your go-to for, for everything. Um, so I just you know, picked up a couple example, uh, couple examples here uh, that tend to be pretty popular. Uh, one of them is based on optically pumping uh, magnetometers. Um, uh, and I should mention also, um, magnetometry is what we're most focused on at Sandbox, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only application, right? You could also use quantum sensing uh, to detect electric fields, as I mentioned earlier. But magnetometry tends to be popular because it has a lot of applications. Um, so OPMs are one way to do that, um, and these typically work by having um, different uh, gases that are trapped in an atomic vapor cell. And um, they're really good sensors. They've been available for quite a while, so it's a fairly mature technology. Um, but again, they have their trade-offs for different applications. Another one that you might have heard of um, in different contexts is NV centers in Diamond. Um, and NV centers are actually useful for many different applications uh, in quantum, not just sensing. Uh, so you might hear about them in the context of networking uh, or even computing. Uh, but we're particularly interested in them uh, in the sensing standpoint. And they are uh, very good sensors. Uh, they have some advantages, um, one of them being the fact that they allow full vector um, sensing, which is quite useful for several applications. Uh, one of the types of sensors that I don't explicitly have on the slide, but you might be familiar with is also based on squids, um, so superconducting uh, technologies. Those are probably the most commercially prevalent, uh, maybe, um, but definitely the one that people are most familiar with. But one of the disadvantages of those types of sensors and why we're looking at um, you know, accelerating development of different types is that with squids, you do need that cryogenic uh, cooling component. Uh, and that really drastically reduces the types of applications uh, that you can do because it's not always uh, very practical um, to, to be able to cryo cryogenically uh, cool uh, your, your devices. So in terms of applications, um, there's many um, that, that one could pursue, uh, but these are a few that we are specifically interested in. Um, in the medical space, uh, you can use quantum-based um, 
sensors to do diagnostics in d different applications. Um, so the way you do that is you would use these sensors to detect the magnetic field in the human body. And you can use that you know, for, for different types. You could do for cardiovascular, you could do uh, brain imaging uh, has also been something that there's some research on. So there's all these different applications, but at the core, you're doing the same thing. You're detecting the magnetic, magnetic field um, inside uh, the human body. Another thing you can do is use these sensors to detect the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and that could be very useful uh, to do things like navigation. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, more on the security space, um, there's some research around chip scale, chip scale sensing. Um, and that is made possible by the fact that we now have sensors that are both very sensitive, uh, but also really small. Um, so if you do that, you can do applications like uh, hardware diagnostic, actually finding, figuring out uh, what, what's going on within the hard drive uh, without necessarily being destructive. And that could have really powerful applications for industry as well. So one of our missions um, at Sandbox, um, when we think about geophysical sensing, is to build an alternative to GPS. So actually leverage the magnetic field uh, that the Earth has um, and use that for uh, different types of detection, um, use that for navigation, as I mentioned, and so really be able to develop a system that enables quantum navigation that does not rely on GPS. So why is that important? Um, there are two main issues with relying on GPS. Uh, one of them is that GPS is not always accessible, um, as is becoming uh, actually more of a well-known problem. Just if, if you look at the news and you see what's happening in Ukraine and uh, other places, um, but GPS is a signal that can be jammed, it can be spoofed, um, so there are some issues, especially for certain communities, to rely exclusively on, on GPS. So this is something that the defense and intelligence communities in particular uh, have been grappling with uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, but there's also ways that GPS can become not available that, you know, have nothing to do with uh, intentional problems, right? Um, there could be interference with other signals. Uh, you could have problems with the satellite that the signal is coming from. So multiple types of customers would have reasons to want to have some sort of redundancy and not be completely reliant on GPS. Another reason why um, GPS is not always uh, the, the right answer is that GPS can be limited when it comes to precision, um, and that becomes prevalent in, in um, some contexts more than others, um, but in urban areas, for example, uh, there could be some issues with the precision of the GPS signal. Um, you have a similar issue when you're looking to do things underwater or underground, uh, where the, you either can't do it or the limits to the precision just become so bad that you know, it affects your ability to actually know your location. Um, and the, this is a pretty big problem, actually. This was mind-blowing for me when I started working at uh, Sandbox because I knew GPS was important, but I never realized how important it was. Um, and it turns out that in 2019, uh, NIST commissioned this uh, study about the economic impact of GPS. And what they found was that the econ economic cost of losing GPS for just one day was a was billion dollar uh, to the US economy. So it's a pretty big deal, and it makes sense to customers that really rely on GPS are looking at different alternatives. So how do quantum sensors um, help with this? Uh, one way is to use quantum magnetometers, as I mentioned, to look at um, the Earth's magnetic field. And what that gives you is that magnetic map uh, that you're looking at. And then there's some denoising that needs to happen. This is where the machine learning methods come in. And that gives you a sense of your location, and it can even give you a precise uh, position of uh, your location. Um, and that's the core concept. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, now, of course, in practice, there's a lot of things that make this hard, uh, one of them being the fact that you have to have these anomaly maps um, that, that um, you can rely on. So that's still something that the community is working on, on putting together better maps. Uh, but the core concept is pretty simple, and one of the advantages is that 
the magnetic field is something that is always there. Uh, this is a signal that will always be present. Uh, it can't be jammed. Uh, it would be very hard to, to try to spoof it or block it. Um, so it has a lot of uh, appeal, and this is a technique that has been field tested, um, and uh, it's, it shows a lot of promise in terms of becoming more prevalent, but in terms of the technical reality of it, it's something that has been shown to work already. So moving on to a second application, completely different, but again still within quantum sensing, is uh, looking at this for medical applications. So here what we're trying to do, our ultimate goal, um, is to improve the confidence and speed in patient care decisions. And there's two sides of how we're approaching this. One of them is from the hardware front. Um, so what we're doing there is looking at devices that can leverage quantum sensing um, that can be used in that medical setting. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of the um, what it looks like um, in terms of the capabilities I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you can't have cryogenic cooling in, in certain environments. So we're trying to reduce that footprint. Uh, we're trying to make these sensors very precise without adding a lot of uh, hardware. We're trying to make these things as portable as possible. And there's also a, um, a data um, and, and uh, machine learning problem in this, which is we want to go not just from these magnetic signals um, to some graph, but we want to make, do that in a way that gives the doctors or the physicians uh, a way to make clinical decisions, because at the end of the day, that's the point, is that they can do this faster than with current technologies. So there's a heavy software component to this as well, and making sure that we're developing the right machine learning algorithms um, to help make those decisions, regardless of the, the hardware backend. Um, some Applications that we're looking at uh, include uh, doing this, developing MCGs uh, for cardiovascular disease. Um, and the reason why is because we can use this technique to detect the magnetic fields that are generated by the electrical activity uh, from, from the heart. Um, so you might be wondering, why do we need this? Don't we have EKGs? Um, and the, the problem with EKGs is they can't actually detect every single type of heart attack. Um, and it's actually very important to be able to triage the different types uh, very quickly when you're in an emergency room setting. So the way we're looking at this is as a way to potentially augment um, EKG, uh, augment its diagnostic capabilities, uh, but also as a way to detect signals um, that help make decisions that you wouldn't otherwise have a way to make. Thank you. Um, so, Simulation and optimization is another area that uh, we are working on quite a bit. Um, there's different applications. Um, I won't go into this um, in too much detail, um, but you could basically uh, do this for life sciences. You could also look at molecular structures for material science applications. Um, at the basic level, you're basically developing better chemistry, so there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination between these different applications. One of the things that we're focused on is helping pharmaceutical companies um, have a more efficient drug discovery pipeline. Um, so help them with these simulations so that they could either reduce the cost or reduce the development time uh, or have higher uh, confidence that the drugs that they are focused on will actually not fail clinical trials because that is very expensive uh, failure if it happens at that late stage. Um, so there's ways to do this uh, already with traditional simulation and machine learning methods, um, but they have some downsides, which is why we're trying to supplement this with our software. Uh, one of the things I want to call out is um, there was a question this morning um, when there's quantum computing papers that say that they can do simulation, is, does that do damage uh, to, to the community? Um, one of the things that we're looking at is doing this with accelerated hardware that is not quantum. Uh, for, for that very reason that, that that person was mentioning, that the quantum computers that we have today are very limited. So even though there is potential in using quantum computers uh, to do molecular simulation and help with the drug discovery, it's still at the very early stage. So what we're trying to do is bridge the gap with classical uh, hardware that's very advanced, so things like GPUs and TPUs, uh, but not rely on that quantum hardware to become available. 
Um, we have a few papers in this area uh, showing different types of simulations that the team has been able to do. Uh, one of the things that Sandbox was very focused on early on was doing these DFT simulation, and we actually have the record still, I think, for the largest DFT quantum chemistry simulation, which is pretty cool. Uh, we've also done these types of simulations with tensor networks on uh, Google's TPUs, uh, and this was uh, quite interesting because TPUs were leveraged uh, originally just for machine learning, not to do these types of computations. So this was the first um, demonstration that you could do more uh, with TPUs. The last um, topic that we focus on at Sandbox is quantum uh, security. Um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm already over time. Uh, but basically the idea is how do we think about quantum uh, computers um, in, in terms of their impact on cryptography uh, and, and encryption. Uh, one of the reasons that our customers are focused on um, this right now is because the value of data uh, for some of them continues over time. So there is the potential that somebody could take this data uh, that is valuable now, store it, and then decrypt it later when quantum computers are available. NIST has done a great job um, trying to standardize this process. This is something that's been going on since 2015. And four of the candidates for standardization were just um, uh, announced uh, over the summer. So this is an exciting time for us um, helping customers figure out uh, how, how to get ready for that standardization. But one of the things that we're doing um, is look beyond post-quantum cryptography um, and also help them look at how to manage cryptography better uh, within the enterprise. So one of the nice things about this problem that was entirely quantum, how do we move uh, to post-quantum cryptography, is that it's uh, triggering conversations uh, with enterprises about cryptography as a whole uh, and the fact that cryptography is something that is very hard to manage right now. It's hard-coded. Um, it's within the applications. It's very hard for enterprises to figure out what is going on. Um, so. Our product helps with that as well, um, and what we're trying to do is help customers move towards that cryptographic agility. I'm not going to get into this diagram, but if you do uh, have questions about this um, security product, um, I'm happy to answer that afterwards. Um, and finally, the one thing that I want to mention is that we have a strategic investment program. And one of the reasons that we're doing that is because we think it's very important to be investing in the quantum security ecosystem as, as a whole. Uh, I think as several of the conversations during this event have, have highlighted. Um, so our most recent investments have been Evolution Q, uh, who are doing great work in the QKD space, and QNACT, uh, who are working on quantum repeaters and, and quantum memory. Um, and again, I think this idea idea that quantum networking uh, could, could become a very interesting area for some of our customers um, is, is, is something that we want to keep investing in and keep collaborating with uh, many different uh, players here. Um, so thank you for, for having me, and I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Nadia, for a great talk. Do we have some questions from the audience? Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, can you say a little bit more uh, about what you mean by DFT simulation on a quantum computer? Because I thought you could not solve nonlinear differential equation on a quantum computer yet. Yeah, so the, the big clarification there is that was not done on a quantum computer. Uh, that was done on classical hardware, on a, oh. advanced CPUs and, and GPUs, uh, for the exact reason that, that you mentioned. Oh, okay. and, and so that, that's one of the things that we're trying to do, is, to fig is figure out how can we extract as much power as possible from the existing advanced hardware before we can do these things on, on quantum computers, if we can ever do these things on quantum computers. Can I ask a quick So, So what do you mean then by uh, the fact that you have done the largest DFT simulation? Can you uh, explain what, which simulation it is? I don't know on top of my head. I'd have to refer you to, to the paper. Um, but it was the, the largest number of qubits um, that was ever done using that algorithm. But I can point you to the archive paper. But qubits mean, sorry, you said that uh, the DFT simulation was classical. It was done on a classical computer simulating a quantum system. Oh, I, know, I got it. Thank you. 
you mentioned a couple different applications of magnetometry and a couple different types of sensors, atomic and, and B-centers. Have you yeah. connected sensors to applications, or can you comment on that? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's a little bit too early uh, to, to really make a call either way. Uh, again, because there's so many pros and cons uh, on, on both. What we're trying to do is remain as hardware agnostic as long as possible and, and evaluate all the different possibilities. So there might even be other uh, sensor modalities that I didn't even mention uh, that might come out and, and just have the right specs for that application. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do for navigation, for example, is serve the community that needs the to be able to navigate without GPS. And for the medical settings, it's a combination of they have certain precision that they need to hit, and then in terms of um, size and, and operational requirements, um, they're, they're even more demanding. So we're trying to make sure we stay within that. But if they end up being completely different types of sensors on both sides, that would be OK. If we can leverage some commonalities uh, across both, that would be great as well. But we're really uh, hardware agnostic when it comes to that. And we're also trying not to do all of the hardware development in-house. Uh, actually, we're mostly doing hardware development as a necessity. Uh, but we would love to partner with people that are already in that space and focus on the software and, and the AI um, piece. Thanks for talking. It was cool to see what people are thinking about in the quantum sensing world. Um, I was curious, and I apologize if this dives into the weeds a little bit too much, but um, I thought the idea of using magnetic anomalies for geolocation was cool. I was curious whether you knew, like, sort of what length scales you, these magnetic anomalies might be, so, like, how well we might expect to be able to locate, and then whether you have any sort of time variation on those anomalies, like... Is that if you if you identify an anomaly, is that something you can use for, for a year to locate yourself, or for 100 years, or anything like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, the answer is a combination of it depends, and I'm not really sure like where and how it depends. Uh, so I'll have to refer to you to somebody on my team that focuses on navigation. Uh, but we haven't had any issues yet where the maps were just so completely out of date um, that we weren't able to do anything with it. It's probably going to happen at some point. Um, one of the challenges is that some areas are more mapped than, than others, so, so I think that that, that's going to, you know, co come come back to to your point of, you know, will it allow enough uh, location? Um, the signal processing is also key um, to to make sure that we're not relying completely on just one point on the map, or that we're not, um, you know, because we, if if you just use the map itself and you don't do any denoising and, and any signal processing, you can't really have an accurate location with, with a high level of confidence. So trying to increase that level of confidence using the, the AI processing is also a big part of the solution. Okay, thank but you. yeah, but I'd, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the navigation team. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you for the great presentation. I guess I just had a question about how there are so many different kinds of quantum sensors out there, and it seems that uh, Sandbox AQ is focusing on a lot of different quantum angles. Um, but you seem to focus, when you talk about quantum sensing, specifically on the, these magnetometers. Is there a particular reason that those, among the different kinds of quantum sensors, stood out to Sandbox AQ? Is, is there something particular about that kind of quantum sensor? Or is this part of a portfolio approach, and there's other quantum sensors that you are also looking into? Yeah, uh, great question. So for us, we started from the application and worked backwards from that. Uh, and so we saw the biggest need for medical settings um, because A, that has really the, the, the potential to, to be really impactful, I mean, literally saving lives, um, and um, also something that hasn't really been well tackled with classical sensor. So, so for us, again, it's providing that value to customers. I mean, that's what I like to do in product development in general, is really solve the problem, regardless of if the technology solving it is going to be quantum or not. Um, so it wouldn't really make sense to do something just because it's a quantum sensor if you could do it just as well, uh, or even better with a classical sensor. So magnetometry was one of those applications where we thought, you know, quantum sensors could really make a, a difference here. Um, and then there's some categories of, of quantum um, sensors like you know timing and you know precision clocks that are a little bit outside of where it, it feels like we really could provide value right now um, because there's a lot of people doing that as well. Um, but certain types of sensors like you know detecting electric fields, for example, or inertial sensors, 
we're not doing that today, but it's not because we looked at it and said it's not interesting. It's just because we haven't had an application that made sense and, and customers that were really clamoring for a solution there. Thank you. We have time for one last question, if there's one there in the, oh, behind you. Yeah. Um, hi. So I loved how when you were talking about the balance between um, AI and quantum, it's more about helping solve impossible customer problems. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, your company, um, I imagine that when it comes to trying to make money and solve customer problems, AI is just so much farther along um, in terms of its applicability and adoption. Is it hard to sort of balance still leaning into some of the more cutting edge quantum things that might not quite be ready commercially while not only just leaning into the A of AQ? Yeah, I, as, a, as a product person, I love that question um, because one of the things that I always try to do in the product portfolio is to have a, a balance, not just a balance of technologies, but also a balance of different timeframes. Um, and I think that's really the key there. I think the AI is more advanced in, in some cases, and we can repurpose a lot of the, the machine learning approaches that have already been developed. And that provides short-term benefits, uh, for sure. But at the same time, it's really important to be thinking of the next step. And that's where we're investing uh, in the quantum technologies very heavily. Um, so the idea is at some point, you know, the quantum technologies, I mean, not just us, but the whole community will, will accelerate that enough that the two will, will, you know, be neck and neck or the two will be even more, uh, more complementary. Um, but it wouldn't make sense to just focus on, on the short term. We really think it's, um, it, it's good to think about both and um, just invest in the future. Thanks. Well, let's thank Nadia again.